The following is a presentation of Castleview Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Americans love competition, right? Reminded of that this past Thursday, we eat food and we sit around and watch people compete, maybe even played some competitive games. Well, if you looked up the most watched TV events in the U.S. in 2016, don't do that right now, I did it for you. If you looked them up, what you would find is the top eight fall into two categories. Four of them are sporting events. Four of them are political debates. Many of us would claim, I hear people say, you know, I'm not really into political arguments, but man, millions of us love to tune in. Over 80 million would tune in to a single debate to watch these arguments take place. Most of us, when we turn into a debate, statistically speaking, you already know which candidate you like before you watch the debate. And most of us probably have our preconceived impressions and beliefs confirmed by what we see, whether it's for one or for the other candidate. If you believe your candidate is the better person with better ideas, chances are at the end of the debate, you'll be even more convinced of how right you were before the debate started. But there are those few who watched who are the unconvinced voters. We always hear about them. Sometimes the news stations will bring together a group of those mysterious and elusive unconvinced voters. Who are they? What are they thinking? They come to the debate trying to decide which candidate to vote for. And usually they're investigating two things about each candidate. One, what do I think of this person's arguments, their ideas? Two, what do I think of that person? Do I like them? Do I trust them? Both the idea and the person are important, and both are revealed to some degree in the midst of the argument, of the debate. Well, our passage this morning, Mark chapter 2, you can turn there, it describes this ongoing debate between Jesus and the Jewish religious leaders of his time. And we're like the audience of the debate. We're listening in, we're watching, and as we watch, we're learning about both sides. So Mark chapter 2, last week up through verse 17, we saw these two scenes where the scribes of the Pharisees are questioning Jesus. They're curious about his actions, maybe a little bit concerned with the crowd that he's running with. Well, this theme continues in the three stories we're going to look at today. In these interactions, we're going to learn more about Jesus, and we're going to learn more about his opponents, both the content of their arguments and the character that they reveal in these debates. I'm going to read all three to start out. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. We're going to read through chapter 3, verse 6. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, to Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. 
And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately had counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Well, let's look at these three debates and see what we learn about Jesus and his opponents and their arguments as well as their character. First, focusing on Jesus before we examine his opponents. First, Jesus changes religion. The first question here really comes from the people, not directly from the Pharisees. And it might have been an honest question. Why don't your disciples fast? The question isn't aimed really at the disciples, of course, but at Jesus. The Jewish religious practice at that time held that there were three fundamental expressions of being someone who followed God. Three things. One, almsgiving, giving to the poor, praying, and fasting. Fasting was considered to being basic part of being a God-fearing Jew. So these people might have been shocked to find Jesus and his disciples, in particular, don't fast. What does the law say? What does God's word say? What do the Old Covenant scriptures say about fasting? They don't say much. There's just one required fast. That was on the Day of Atonement, once a year, when the people were required to fast. But we do know that the people, and sometimes the entire nation of Israel or of Judah, would sometimes fast for specific purposes. We see that later in the prophets in the Old Testament. Sometimes that was an expression of mourning over a tragedy, Sometimes they fasted because they were crying out to God for relief from a crisis. Many times the fasting was connected to repentance, turning back to God. And that was expressed in the fasting, doing without food or food and drink. By Jesus' time, serious, committed religious Jews fasted regularly to show their devotion to God. And the Pharisees in particular were known for often fasting twice a week. You see that in Luke where the Pharisee is praying to God. He said, oh God, I fast twice a week, usually on Mondays and Thursdays, and that would be from from sunup to sundown, they would fast. Well, if you're familiar with the New Testament, you've certainly heard of the Pharisees, and you probably have a bad connotation of them. So it's hard for us to step in and see the Pharisees as anything but villains. But if you're a first century Jew, and you're religious you probably have a very different impression of the Pharisees. We probably would have had a good deal of respect for the Pharisees. Phariseeism was a lay movement that was very influential at Jesus' time, and it lasted even through some persecutions after Jesus when other schools of Judaism had passed away. Phariseeism continued on. And these, this party of Jewish people, you might have heard of others, the Sadducees or the Zealots or the Essenes, But the Pharisees were known for being men of the word. They were devoted to the Torah. One scholar says, Jesus himself stood closer to the foundational beliefs of the Pharisees than to any other party of Judaism. Now the people asking questions here know about the Pharisees, and they know that their disciples are faithful to fast. And they know that even John the Baptist, who's the forerunner to Jesus, his disciples fasted. Now Jesus comes, and he's hard to figure out. He's impressive, but they're not sure what to do with him. He's a powerful teacher and healer, but he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And now we find out his disciples don't even fast. And they might have thought, man, I don't know what to make of this guy. What do we know? Well, we know what godliness looks like. And it includes things like prayer and fasting. So the fact that his disciples don't do that basic religious thing calls everything into question. Jesus is starting to look like a fitness coach whose followers, whose clients never work out. Well, what are you, what are you doing? If, if they don't do the most basic thing, are you then invalidated as their leader? The implied question is, why aren't your disciples godly? Jesus gives that response, it's pretty unusual, three images, wedding, a patched garment, and wine in wineskins. It starts out with wedding, verse 19. He says, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Huh, that's interesting. What's he talking about here? 
Well, you remember John's ministry and what it was about. It was about repentance. It was about preparation for the one who was coming, right? He's saying, get ready for the one who's coming after me, who's far greater than I. The nature of his ministry then, because it was about repentance and preparation, aligned with the purpose of fasting. But the purposes of fasting, mourning, repentance, crying out for God's blessing, were not relevant anymore now that the bridegroom, the one waited for, had come. That wedding imagery is something we see in the Old Testament often to describe the covenant relationship between the Lord, Yahweh, and his people. So it's appropriate here for Jesus to use that picture to describe himself. He was the coming Lord, coming to betroth his people with a new covenant. But the original hearers of what he's saying probably didn't get all that. It's one of those things where Jesus says something that later you see has even a greater and deeper meaning. But initially, it's just the illustration itself. You don't fast at a wedding. Now, weddings in that culture were celebrations that would last for a week, and they would involve serious feasting and partying. You think of Thanksgiving, but for a week. And no football, but lots of dancing. That's kind of what you can picture. That's what the wedding party was like. And people, once the wedding feast started, would enjoy the feast. Fasting was unthinkable during the feast. You might fast in anticipation of a feast, but you don't fast during a feast. Here's what Jesus is saying. Anticipation should look different than realization. Anticipation should look different than realization. My kids love to anticipate what's coming. Uh, And so we often have one or sometimes more. Recently, we had more paper chains in our house. And every day we're tearing off one chain, anticipating what's coming. So we had a Thanksgiving chain looking forward to that day. You say, how much longer till Thanksgiving? You say, look at the chain. And you'd see visually about how much longer. That was a sign of their excitement, of their longing for what was coming. But on the day of Thanksgiving, if you were to say, where's your paper chain? If you don't have a paper chain, you must not care much about Thanksgiving. Well, it's like, no, no, no. The time has changed. Now the event has come. Now it's not the time for waiting and saying, oh man, how much longer, how many more days until the celebration? The time has come. It's time to eat. It's time to celebrate. The time of anticipation is done. The time has come. Now, Jesus throws in another statement here. He says in verse 20, the days will come It's a very curious thing. There it is. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And then they will fast in that day. Well, that's probably a veiled reference to his death, something that they would later understand. But then verse 21 and 22, he says some other interesting thing. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the the patch tears away from it. The new from the old and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins. The wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Well, even if you don't sew patches, and I don't, or even if you don't work with wine, you get the main idea here, right? A new patch on an old garment would shrink. So you've got a, a, a tear or a hole, and you patch on some new garment, but then it's washed and it shrinks, it pulls away, and it actually makes the tear worse than it was to begin with. With the wine, apparently new wine shouldn't have been put in old wineskins or they would burst. Here's the point of both of those little sayings. You can't add the new to the old or they'll be destroyed. Here's the point. Times have changed. With the coming of Jesus, a new era has begun. Remember back in chapter one, he said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus and his ministry are not compatible with the Pharisees and their old covenant religiosity. You can't mix the two. These people were starting out with their own idea of godliness and then saying, well, how does Jesus fit in with this 
But Jesus is clear. He's not calling his followers to deeper religious rituals. Instead, he's redirecting them to himself. You can't tack Jesus on to human religion. Sometimes we try to do that, but you can't. You can't simply add him to your prior idea of what it means to be religious. Maybe some of you today are here because you are trying to dig deeper and perform better your religious rituals. Or maybe you're here and you'd say, you know, I'm just trying to make some positive changes in my life. Coming to church is part of that self-improvement plan. Well, if that's you, we're very glad you're here. I'm so glad that you're here and we hope you keep coming back. But I think it's important to, to notice for you to understand that being a Christian isn't about turning your life around, becoming a better person, and then seeing how can Jesus help me to do that. That's not what Christianity is about. Being a Christian means abandoning all those other religious hopes and allowing Jesus to change your idea of what true religion or true spirituality really is. It means your entire life and worship becomes oriented around him. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is clear that Jesus didn't come to help us be better people. He came to help us know that we're not good people, and yet that we can be made right with God through him. That's why he came. That's why he died on the cross, taking a penalty he didn't deserve, dying in the place of sinners like us, taking the punishment we deserve, and then rising again to new life. That we can receive what he provides by trusting that his death was for me, that his resurrection will give me new life. If that's a new idea or one you want to think more about, and I would, I would encourage you, it's probably the most important idea you could think more about. We'd love to talk to you more about that. After the service, come find me. Uh, there'll be other elders out in the lobby that you can find right after the service. Come and just say, I'd love to do a Bible story. I just have more questions about what it means to be a Christian. Well, back to the matter here of fasting. It's remarkable how easily we can be drawn to measure our spirituality by external markers. There are a lot of dangers of this. One, this is toxic in a church family because once I judge my own spiritual performance, then I'll start to judge yours too. Why doesn't he fast and pray as much as I do? We have to run away from comparing ourselves to others based on religious performance. We, we can't be put into different categories based on our religious acts, our spiritual disciplines. We come together around Jesus, and we rejoice together that the bridegroom has come. The people here asking this question, I think, should be a warning to us. It's possible, it's possible to be disciplined in religion and miss the whole point. It's possible to be serious and sincere and miss Jesus. Your religious performance can make you feel good about yourself, and it can even impress other people. But if it isn't centered on the person and the work of Jesus, it's not going to do you any good. We do encourage you, and all of us, to be serious Christians. We do encourage, we even teach classes on what we call the spiritual disciplines and see the value of those things. But we always want to be careful when we're valuing and emphasizing things like memorizing scripture, spending time in solitude, even fasting. Doing these things does not impress God. And it doesn't indicate your spiritual level, your spiritual grade. These things have value only insofar as they draw you closer to God. And they have no spiritual value apart from Jesus Christ. You know, one other implication from this teaching about the newness of what Christ brings is for us as a church, it, it explains, depending on your background, if you've wondered, it explains why we don't take everything we find, especially in the Old Testament, and try to find expressions for that in our gathered worship together. We don't use those Old Covenant forms. We don't have... We don't call anything altars up here. Uh, we don't burn incense. We don't do other things. And sometimes we can read and think, that sounds interesting. I like it because it's more tangible. We have sights. We have smells in the Old Testament. 
why not use some of those or something like that to really give a, a holistic, worshipful experience? Well, the reason we don't do that is we because we think those things could undermine the newness of what Jesus came to do. We, we have visuals like baptism and the Lord's Supper, things that Jesus instituted, but we've left behind all sorts of old covenant forms of worship. Well, we move on to the next scene. Mark moves from this question about fasting to a question about the Sabbath. Let's read that again. Verse 23. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In these verses, Jesus interprets the Sabbath. If fasting was considered important for Jews at that time, the Sabbath was even more significant, far more significant. There were a few things that marked off the Jewish people from outsiders, from Gentiles, from pagans. You had their food laws, and then you had a couple of covenant signs. One, circumcision, and two, observing the Sabbath. These were clearly laid out in God's law. God's people were to show they belonged to him by these outward signs. It wasn't wrong to do those things. That wasn't a wrong form of religiosity just because you did those things. In fact, these things were required by God, and if you failed to do them, you were disobeying God, and you were justly cut off from God's people. The Sabbath in particular is so important, you might know it's one of the Ten Commandments. So you can listen, or if you want to turn there, it's in Exodus 20. The Lord says in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. As the Lord, as Yahweh, had rested on the seventh day after creating the world, so his people, Israel, were to rest each week on the seventh day in the Sabbath. A few chapters later in Exodus, chapter 31, the law says that those who work on the Sabbath and profane it will be cut off from their people or even put to death. Violating the Sabbath was a big deal. And it was a big deal to God. They weren't just making that up. So maybe, even though it's hard for us to relate, we can understand their seriousness about the Sabbath. When you worked on the Sabbath, you were treating it as profane, even though God had made it holy. And so you were undermining God's authority. You were essentially spitting on this special covenant he had made with his people. And that's why the Jews were so eager to keep the Sabbath. One example, just a few generations before Jesus, some Jewish people, it's reported, were unwilling to defend themselves against Gentiles who attacked on the Sabbath. They were ready to die before breaking the Sabbath in self-defense because that would be work. Well, the Pharisees' zeal here for Sabbath keeping is understandable, and their questions they have for Jesus really are more like accusations. Why are your disciples doing what's not lawful? Question, again, not aimed at the disciples, but at Jesus, like asking a parent, um, excuse me, why are your kids running around on the street? Uh, why are your kids you know, throwing apples at cars that drive by. You're not asking questions about the kids like you need information. You're accusing the parents, and they're accusing Jesus. What was the alleged violation? The disciples were eating grain as they walked by some fields. Now, you might think, is that stealing? It's not, and there's, it's even clearly laid out in the Old Testament law that you're allowed to do that. You couldn't go to someone else's field and, and get your harvest there. That would be stealing. But to walk by and to feed yourself, that was Okay. That was allowed. The problem is they're doing it on the Sabbath. Now, everybody agreed that work on the Sabbath was not allowed. That's clear in Scripture. But the rabbis debated for generations what counted as work. What constituted work? Some Jewish texts laid out dozens of specific rules 
to help people avoid breaking the Sabbath. And by specific, I mean they tried to cover every possible scenario you can imagine. For instance, actions that profane the Sabbath included, quote, tying or loosening knots, sewing more than one stitch, or writing more than one letter. I don't know why you would want to write one letter. I don't know what you'd do with that. <laughs> Maybe every Sabbath you could add one letter to a sentence. One scholar says the comprehensiveness of the tradition is revealed in this ruling. If a building fell over on the Sabbath, enough rubble could be removed to discover if any victims were dead or alive. If alive, they could be rescued. But if dead, the corpses must be left until sunset. Well, in this detailed rabbinic tradition, plucking heads of grain was categorized as harvesting crops. Harvesting is work. So when the Pharisees say their actions are unlawful, what they mean is it's unlawful according to the Old Testament law as interpreted by this tradition. Now, the Pharisees' use of Scripture might be understandable, but they were making a very subtle and dangerous error. They were convinced that a detailed, narrow application of the Sabbath law was the same as the law itself. And in doing this, they were very close to adding to Scripture. And in fact, their narrow application of the law was a poor application, according to Jesus, because it missed the intent of the law. Jesus makes this point reminding them of an Old Testament story. You can find the story in 1 Samuel 21, but the important details are are explained here by Jesus. David and his men are desperate and hungry. They were actually on the run from King Saul. And they go to the tabernacle and eat the bread of the presence, which was holy and set apart for the priests. Well, the story there isn't about the Sabbath, but it's about David and his men doing something that appeared to violate the law. So it's similar in that way to Jesus' disciples plucking grain. Jesus is using David and his men as a precedent for what the disciples were doing. And Jesus uses the story to show that the Pharisees were misusing the law. Look at his conclusion in verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath was made to bless God's people, not burden them. It wasn't just an arbitrary rule. It was a gift. It was for their health, for their prosperity. Now, we don't have time, I wish we did, to talk more about the Sabbath and its application today. I'll say, in brief... Christians who agree on the gospel can disagree on how to obey, or should we even obey, the Sabbath. I think there's good reason in the New Testament to believe that the Sabbath rest was fulfilled in that spiritual rest we have in Jesus Christ. You can go to Hebrews chapter 4 or Colossians chapter 2 if you want to see and study more about that. And even so, the Sabbath rest... And that principle of rest reminds us that resting from work intentionally remains a gift for our good. It's good to take that intentional time to rest our bodies, rest our souls, in part because we need it, in part because it reminds us that we're not God. We need sleep, we need rest. That's a good thing, and that's a gift from God. But the Pharisees are taking the Sabbath, a gift from God for the good of his people, and they're turning it into a religious performance test. If you didn't keep it, according to their narrow interpretation, you were a lawbreaker. Some of us are inclined to be a little bit like this. We like to add some clear rules in order to make a more clear standard to keep. Sometimes scripture is not as specific as we'd like, and so we kind of help it out and get a little more specific so that then we've got that clear standard and now we can know, have we kept it or not? There's no question, it's black and white. At one level, this might be well intended. You might wanna guard against sinning. And, and certainly there's a place for wisdom and for boundaries. But that motivation and that desire to guard against sinning at all costs, I wanna know exactly where the line is in every situation so I can be sure not to cross it, has its problems. You can do this and miss the point of God's commands by turning them into a path for spiritual performance. They become your guide to ensure that you've avoided doing what was wrong, and at the same time to let you know when other people cross the line. That's what's happening here. This rulemaking tendency is one we have to be very guarded against because it's natural to our human hearts, 
And it's not that uncommon in churches like ours that really value God's word and believe it to be true. And we want to be serious Christians. It's a temptation that we have to avoid. This is why even in our church covenant, we have gone to great lengths not to prohibit what scripture does not prohibit. So we don't have rules about what we eat or drink or wear. Some would say, well, the safest path is to prohibit things that could lead to sin. But this is, I think, the Pharisees' path. And it only means just trading one type of sin for another. It's not too dissimilar from what the serpent did. Though it may be well-intended, it's like what the serpent did to Eve. Did God really say, you must not touch any tree? You must not have any tree in the garden? Well, God didn't say that. You could turn that into, hey, you know what? Kids, to be safe, instead of avoiding the one tree, let's just avoid trees. Well, in doing that, you would be turning what God has said, you'd be, you'd be changing what God has said, twisting scripture, and in the process, making God seem less generous than he really is. Well, verse 27, we just read, Jesus contradicts the Pharisees. They've long debated how to keep the Sabbath. Jesus just shows up and he dismisses their traditions. Hey, you've missed the point. And then verse 28, he goes even further. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is bold. This is an audacious claim. He's creating this title for himself. It probably sounded absurd to those people. He's claiming authority over the Sabbath, the holy day that God himself instituted as a special covenant sign for his people. He's saying he has authority to overrule the respected tradition of the rabbis. He's asserting that he has the right to declare God's mind, his true intent, For the Sabbath? Well, we get to chapter 3. And Jesus goes even further by applying his teaching about the Sabbath. In other words, we could say, number three, Jesus practices what he preaches. He interpreted the Sabbath. Now he lives out that interpretation by helping someone on the Sabbath. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. The Pharisees continued to provide excellent examples of how not to live the Christian life. But sometimes I see myself in them. Do you ever do this? Do you ever watch people? Maybe people at work, people at church, just waiting for them to say or do the wrong thing? This sort of Vigilant fault finding is a great way to destroy a relationship, a friendship, a marriage. Verse 3, he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to them, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Pharisees keep revealing the nature of their religion. They are obsessed with the letter of their man-made law. They don't care about people. They show zero concern for the man whose hand is withered and unusable. He's just a means to an end. He's a way to trap Jesus. It's remarkable for all their fear of committing sins of commission... They seem oblivious to sins of omission. They're so careful not to do wrong, but they're okay with not doing right. You think of James, where he says, anybody who knows the good he ought to do, but he doesn't do it, that person is sinning. That's another mark of their religiosity. They're focused on being good with God, but they don't care about others. The focus of their spirituality is vertical, and the horizontal plane pretty much ignored. If you're careful to keep your Christian practices and habits, but you're unwilling to be inconvenienced and spend yourself to help a brother or sister in need, to have that get-to-know-you conversation even though it's not your favorite, to extend love and care to them by going out of your way to bring them a meal or pick them up and bring them to church. If that's your path, you're following the Pharisee's path. 
We're called to love people more than we love ourselves. Well, in this scene, the Pharisees don't actually say anything, and they don't have to, because Jesus knows they're watching him, waiting to accuse him. And this time, he goes on the offensive. He has that question, is it lawful? You want to talk about the law? You want to talk about law breaking? I'll ask you a question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? There's not a good answer for them. Given their dilemma, they think better of it and keep their mouths shut. And Jesus tells the man to stretch out his hand. Just imagine. I don't know what that withered hand looked like, but it was unusable. And at Jesus' command, he stretches it out and he has use of it. It's life-changing. But it's interesting, right before he stretches it out, what the text says about Jesus. Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus is angry and grieved. It's a striking combination of emotions. He was right to be angry that the Pharisees, these respected religious men, had no love for their neighbor. They missed the purpose of God's law so badly, they didn't even know they were sinning. And at the same time, he's grieved by the hardness and the blindness of his own people. They're so hardened that they couldn't even celebrate or enjoy this life-changing miracle. One little thing we learn from Jesus' response is that anger and sorrow can be good, right responses. And if hard-hearted sin doesn't bother you, that's not a mark of holiness. It might be good to ask, What typically angers and grieves me? Are they the same things that anger and grieve Jesus or other things? Well, throughout chapter 2, there's this growing conflict between Jesus and the respected religious leaders. First, they question in their hearts about him declaring that the paralytic is forgiven. Then they ask his disciples why he eats with tax collectors and sinners. That can't be right. And now, more directly, they're asking about his disciples and their alleged law-breaking. But in chapter 3, they get pushed too far. And they plot with the Herodians how to destroy him. The Herodians, who are they? Probably supporters of Herod and his dynasty. And what's surprising is they were Hellenists. In other words, they embraced Greek culture, Greek influence, which was abhorrent to these religious Pharisees. So they're strange allies. But it was one of those, the enemies of my enemies are my friends type situations. The opposition to Jesus brought them together. That's how much the Pharisees had come to despise Jesus. They didn't care who they had to join forces with as long as he was destroyed. These pious Jews are so convinced that the lawless rabbi must be stopped. They want him to die. You look at his question again in verse 4, and you see it applies not only to the man with the withered hand, but to the Pharisees too, right? You think about what's lawful on the Sabbath to do good or harm, and or we're thinking about, yeah, he's restoring the man's hand. He's doing good. But I think there's a double meaning there because he says to save life or to kill. Well, those weren't the options. They weren't going to kill the man with the withered hand, right? But the Pharisees turn around and plot how they can destroy Jesus. Note the deception of sin. Their pursuit of this most unlawful act was disguised as religious zeal, zeal for God's law. A hard heart will justify sin, convincing you that you can do, even that you should do, something that is clearly wrong. Well, for this morning, that ends looking at the debates. They'll have a few more runnings in the Gospel of Mark. But we've seen both sides of the debate, listened to their arguments, we've seen their character, and there's no doubt in my mind that if we took a vote, probably be unanimous for Jesus against the Pharisees, right? Not a question. I hope there's not a question. If there is, I have failed. But even as we've watched these bad guys, the Pharisees, we've seen how much more at times we might be like them than we would prefer to admit. They find security in their religious performance. They use scripture to look down on others and accuse them of sin. They obsess over keeping the rules, but they ignore their brother who's in need. They're hard-hearted, justifying their desire to do harm to someone else. 
if you, like me, can identify with any of these, I hope this morning you're compelled to turn to Jesus, the answer for hard-hearted religious people. He redirects our attention from these religious duties to himself. He's the bridegroom. He's come, and we can rejoice in him. He opposes our spiritual pride. He teaches us to repent of self-centered religion. And in doing this, he frees us from our man-made standards of religious performance. This is what we have in Jesus. We have freedom if we turn. It's one thing to agree that Jesus won his debate against the Pharisees. It's another thing to agree with his assessment of my approach to religion. So may God do this. May he help us. May he give us soft hearts. May he help us to turn to Christ. Let's pray. This has been a presentation of Castleview Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church, please visit castleview.org.